Hi, everyone. I am Gabriel Ryan, and today I'll be presenting our work on precise detection of kernel data races with probabilistic clock set analysis. So I'll start by defining what a data race is. And a data race is a race condition bug with three specific properties. Uh, first, there are two memory access operations to the same memory address. Second, these two accesses can be performed concurrently on different threads. And third, at least one of these accesses is a write that can change the value of the memory. So in practice, data races cause non-deterministic behavior and can have lots of undesirable effects. We can see an example of how this can happen with a data race that, oh, wait. OK, I, I guess, uh, sorry, there, there are no animations. Um, OK, so uh, we can see an example of how this can happen with a data race that we found in the NF new table method in the kernel, where a global variable called uh, global handle is not guarded by the dynamic mutexes in the method when it executes on different net structs. This means that when two different uh, threads execute the NF new table method concurrently, they can perform racing increments to the global handle variable that make the table handles inconsistent. Now, there are two reasons that we should care about preventing data races in the Linux kernel. So first, if we consider a threat model where an attacker has some limited access to execute programs, there is a large attack surface of over 300 different system calls that can be executed together concurrently to potentially trigger data race vulnerabilities. Second, data races can lead to severe vulnerabilities, such as denial of service, information leaks, and uh, privilege escalation. And the most well-known of these is probably the dirty copy on write, or dirty cow vulnerability, uh, which allows an uh, attacker to achieve privilege escalation. So now, hopefully, I've convinced you that uh, unintended data races in the Linux kernel are something that's worth testing for. Now, I'll define our problem setting for testing uh, for data races a bit more precisely. So we start with a corpus of possible system call inputs. And in practice, these inputs are usually kernel fuzzer seeds that are generated uh, from syscaller or another kernel fuzzer. To identify a race, uh, we first need to select a subset of these inputs and then identify a feasible concurrent execution schedule uh, where a race occurs. So this is a very challenging problem where we have an exponential search space over both the uh, input combinations and uh, thread execution schedules. And therefore, in practice, it's impossible to find all races for the kernel. So instead, the focus for testing is on finding as many races as possible given a fixed computational budget. So there are two recent uh, approaches uh, to kernel testing that I'll discuss first. Um, so first, concurrency fuzzing uh, works by applying a fuzzing approach to searching the concurrency space for races. And these approaches generally work by testing some uh, subset of the seeds in the corpus and then fuzzing the execution schedules to maximize a concurrency coverage metric. And when this is done, each execution trace can be checked uh, for races using a sound uh, dynamic race prediction algorithm that uh, has no false positives. So the issue with this approach is that it's searching over this exponential space of uh, schedules and inputs and only testing one seed and schedule combination at a time. So it cannot test uh, most uh, possible seed and schedule combinations. And in practice, this causes it to miss many possible races. So second, alias analysis uh, is an approach that targets the testing based on aliased memory accesses. And the way this works is it first executes and traces each seed in the corpus. It then identifies aliased memory accesses to common addresses and constructs a, a seed and schedule combination to test for races between specific aliased accesses. The challenge here is that system calls will change their behavior and perform different memory accesses every time they're executed due to interactions with other executing threads. And um, these can cause changes to the execution path, uh, heap allocation locations, and uh, pointer values. 
So uh, these changes mean that the system call won't execute the same memory accesses as when it was first traced. And in fact, there will be many spurious aliases that do not correspond to real data races. So we evaluated this and found that only one in a thousand memory accesses will reappear when a uh, system call is executed again. And this leads to approximately a million false positives that need to be tested for every true positive uh, prediction that identifies a race. So compared to concurrency fuzzing, alias analysis has the advantage that it considers all possible races for a set of traces. But it also has the disadvantage that it is very imprecise because it makes the simplifying assumption that a memory access that appears once in a trace is always going to be performed again when that particular system call executes. So therefore, in our approach, we try to balance coverage and precision. So instead of, uh, instead of considering all possible races, we focus on a sp specific subclass of races that we can predict precisely. The intuition behind our approach is that system calls need to access specific memory addresses to perform their functionality. So an example of this is a file write system call must access the file inode struct in order to perform a write. And these memory accesses form a stable set that system calls always perform with high probability when they are executed. Therefore, our key idea is to target race prediction analysis on this stable set and test high probability accesses, and then perform additional lock set analysis on the stable set to make these predictions even more precise. So we call our approach probabilistic lock set analysis, or PLA. And I'll give a quick, uh, precise overview here. So first, we define a random indicator variable for each memory access that is one if the access occurs in the trace and zero otherwise. Second we define the stable set of memory accesses for each input based on indicators that have an expected value higher than a threshold. Finally, we predict races on pairs of accesses in the stable set where the locks held when each access are executed are non-overlapping. So the advantage of this approach is that we can estimate the expected values efficiently with sound theoretical guarantees by executing each input a small number of times and observing which memory accesses occur when it executes. However, it has a limitation that races that only occur on memory accesses under specific execution schedules will be ignored in the analysis because they don't show up as uh, stable accesses uh, when we perform the execution sampling. So it's worth emphasizing that we're making a deliberate trade-off here where we're targeting a specific subclass of data race bugs uh, to focus our analysis on. But for this subclass, we can efficiently find all the bugs uh, that can potentially be triggered by a given set of inputs. So in order to estimate the stable set of memory accesses, we sample uh, memory accesses by executing each seed in the corpus with some other random seeds and schedules and recording their traces. We then identify memory accesses that happen with high probability in the traces and ignore memory accesses that aren't performed consistently or that are performed to different memory addresses on each execution. For race prediction, we first sample each seed in the corpus. We then identify the stable memory accesses along with their locks we ignore memory accesses that are guarded by common locks, and we predict races on unguarded uh, stable accesses that are performed to the same address. We then test each predicted race by controlling the thread execution schedule to force the two memory accesses that are predicted uh, to race to execute concurrently. We then check whether the predicted racing memory accesses are both executed and access the same address uh, in the resulting execution trace. So this allows us to confirm each race we report and also obtain stack traces that can be used for debugging the races. So in practice, this approach is extremely effective at finding data races in the Linux kernel. I'll summarize a few key results. First, in total, we find 183 data races in a recent Linux development kernel. 
and 380% more uh, races than any other system tested in a 24-hour evaluation. Second, our approach can easily be applied to all kernel subsystems, so we're not limited to testing a single module or file system. Third, in terms of security impact, we found 102 races with possible harmful effects, and after reporting, uh, 56 of them were patched by kernel developers. And uh, th these races are clustered on 52 common uh, variables, and 35 of those variables were considered harmful. So, um, Several of these races uh, were associated with both memory corruption and an information leak vulnerability in the kernel network cryptography subsystem that could result in kernel heap memory uh, being copied into an open socket and exposed to an attacker. So when we reported this, uh, this was allocated a high severity CVE. And uh, the data races associated with this vulnerability were first introduced to the kernel in 2013. So I think it's worth emphasizing that this is a race vulnerability with severe security implications that has been tested continuously by other approaches for nearly 10 years without being found. And when we ran probabilistic clock set analysis just, just for our evaluation for this paper, uh, we found this vulnerability immediately on the first try. So this is a method that really works, and it finds real security bugs that are not found by existing approaches. So finally, uh, thank you for listening. And if you're, if you're interested in learning more about PLA, please read our paper or uh, check out our code release. Um, and now I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks again. For questions, please line up at the microphone uh, and state your name and affiliation. Uh, to get the Q&A started, I don't want to go down there. <laughs> this is Giovanni Vigna from UCSB. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about the type of bug, bugs that you found? Were they exploitable? They were just crashing? There were a DOS? There was a leak? What were the kind of categories? Sure, sure. Um, so generally speaking, uh, most data race bugs involve uh, causing undefined behavior. So basically, you have some kind of branch condition or something else where uh, there's going to be a race, and then that's going to cause uh, the branch not to follow a specific deterministic path, but instead do something uh, that isn't necessarily controlled in the logic of the program. Um, and then I think we also had the information leak and memory corruption bugs that I mentioned that were allocated to CVE. Um, and I think uh, those were the main ones. Yeah. Cool. Um, I wondered regarding the. Uh like a, how many threads you're actually supporting. Because one of the issues that, that you have is that like, uh, the Linux kernel has 40 threads running uh, all the time. How do you keep the, the threads apart, and how does your system scale in the order of concurrent threads that are in, a, in addition to the, just the, the one or two user-facing threads that are issuing the system calls? Right, that's a good question. So um, in our threat model, we specifically focus on an attacker who's going to be uh, executing uh, two different uh, input programs together and trying to cause uh, something bad to happen. Um, so OR analysis focuses right now on considering two inputs at a time. However, uh, I think you could potentially uh, scale the analysis to consider uh, more concurrent inputs as well. Okay. Yes. But it will likely explode. Yes, yes. So I think uh, for OR analysis, um, we're making an independence assumption that allows you to uh, scale to more threads. But on the other hand, I think you would see a higher error rate if you were to increase the number of threads. Yep. Interesting thresholds mm -hmm. to explore. Yep. Thank you very much. If there's no more questions, let's give him another hand of applause.